Territory, homeland, and the Métis. And we do pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Nicholas Peet here, who's the uh, final uh, talk here in our MFA lecture series. Uh, just before I do that, I just wanted to mention uh, this show that's not quite a show right now, but uh, uh, these are students here in Alison Norland's drawing class that have had the run of the gallery for uh, the past three weeks, and uh, they've used it as a drawing lab, a studio here, so work is constantly evolving, but they are building up to a proper exhibition on the very last day, and that will happen next Thursday. There's gonna no, it's gonna be a proper exhibition, right? Yes. I'm planning on it. Yes, yes. We have great expectations of this, and there's a, an early reception for it on uh, Thursday afternoon, next Thursday from five till seven. So please uh, come by. Um, so uh, Nicholas Pete. Uh, is now in his second year uh, doing his MFA here in uh, Saskatchewan at the U of S here. He was an international uh, scholar at the Hubei Institute uh, last year, and uh, he just got a, a MITAX, is that how you pronounce it? MITAX. MITAX. MITAX, thank you, Global Link International Graduate <coughs> Research Award to go back to the Hubei Institute. So that's a great partnership that uh, we've developed here with this department and uh, in China, and uh, the more exchanges, uh, the better. So that's really starting to happen now, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, really looking forward to some of the work that Nicholas does over there, and maybe he'll talk about that. Uh, he was in, uh, 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 I'll just mention a couple of the exhibitions that he's been in, in the anthology MFA group show at the Fifth Parallel Gallery in Regina. Uh, he was also uh, in a, a senior printmaking exhibition here at the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery. And I've got an exhibition listed for you here in weather like this, which was an independent solo show at the House of Commons in Toronto. Wow! That sounds fantastic. Was it really as fantastic as it sounds? It was a fun time, but the House of Commons is actually a underground restaurant with my friend. <laughs> 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 Nicholas has been uh, teaching here uh, uh, under a, a graduate teaching fellowship, and he was the recipient of a micro grant from uh, the Saskatchewan Arts Board. Um, he's been an apprentice assistant to uh, uh, Bob Christie. Um, uh, he's been an instructor, as I mentioned, in painting foundations, and and you've done a lot of uh, preparatory work. Preparatory. Preparator, you are a preparator. I try and learn. Work at the College Canderdine Galleries in Dewey Blanche and uh, back in Toronto at the Arts and Letters Club. Um, so I give you Nicholas. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you all for braving the cold and uh, coming out here today. It's been really exciting to see so many faces. Um, so yeah, on this uh, note of maybe Toronto and 
being that I'm from Ontario, I'll, I'll start there for some contextualization of the sort of work we're doing now. Um, as per the show, Marcus mentioned, this is um, one of my final paintings of that period of my life before moving to Saskatchewan. And I wanted to include it in this presentation um, at the outset because for me, I think it really encapsulated a couple of themes that I'm still really deeply interested in and, and continuing, continuing to explore, um, particularly, particularly to do with um, the ideas of ecology and economy, which although they're very different sorts of ways of thinking, ways of um, viewing the structure of our world or the human experience, I think <clears throat> they're very, very much related. So when I was living in Toronto, I was finding that I was really struggling to resolve a sort of sincere and, and honest voice as, as an artist. And I found that I was really oscillating between this this sort of figurative ap approach to painting or in on the other side an abstract approach to painting both which of course influence us as painters heavily being included to big movements um, but while maintaining an active art practice there I think I was paying a lot of attention to other trends going on in the art world and not so much focusing on the sorts of things that I was actually interested in exploring and so looking back at a lot of that older work I see seeds in it of what I'm working through now um, it just hadn't really germinated yet maybe um, so for me this this painting which I titled economies of scale it marks for me a, a personal departure from what I was doing before into the area that I'm working in now. And um, for me, it, it uh, this figure and ground relationship sort of encapsulates this, this dynamic of economy and ecology. Um, and imbued within that the idea that economy is very much a human construct, something, a tool that we've developed to structure our society and, and, and give some kind of order to our experience, but how it also, when you start to really dig deep into how it operates, how it is very much something that, that grows and can be sustainable or not and boom and bust. And these, these sorts of ideas, so it's a big interest of mine to, to go into that and think about how ultimately, yeah, they're related on a deep level, if that makes any sense, I don't know. Anyway, moving right along. So this was a um, early sort of experiment after, after um, entering the program here that was thinking about about landscape from more of a geological perspective. And I call these color studies, but really each one is a visual sort of investigation of the seven most profitable mineral ores that we mine in Canada. So you have gold and copper, iron ore, nickel, <coughs> diamonds, coal, and potash. And after investigating those from a purely painterly sort of way of, of working with materials to evoke the, the same sort of dynamics that these rocks exist in, in the ground, I decided to frame them and then display them in this sort of rock pile in an installation fashion because it juxtaposed this, this idea of the, feti the way we fetishize um, these resources on one level, but how on the other level they're, they are just rocks. They're, they're things that we tear out of the ground. And I mean, just from a color point of view, I think they're quite beautiful. And it, uh, 
was something that on that level just interested me. Um, and so these are some detailed shots of what's going on in each. Um, because something that also interests me a lot is the idea of playing with scale and how we can really zero in and understand something about how these, these uh, parts of the landscape form and I mean you could in looking at them really closely maybe understand something that's going on at a scale that's far far bigger and you know cosmic maybe something that I think about as I work through these sorts of problems um, another thing regarding the way I work is everything takes a lot of time and I've had to sort of train myself to be very patient in the way I work because these sorts of patterns and and ways of evoking landscape through through a uh, vocabulary of painting it doesn't just happen in one session or sitting often it, it takes years um, this this piece here which I provisionally am calling wet and dry because it's sort of alluding to two surfaces one of which is saturated and one of which is is pretty parched and dry and devoid of water um, both of these had their inception right when I started the program and have gone through uh, a sort of uh, evolution of different works over over this this period of time, but and both existing as squares initially, and only very recently in my frustration with how they were resolving as individual pieces, really liking moments within them, but not as a whole. There was this idea to to work in the circular format, cut them out, and then bring them bring them together. And and I don't that's not a premeditated thing. It's not something I think about when I begin a, a project. It's something that often just unfolds and happens. And and I I'm trying to to embrace that as a way of working and enter into a project knowing that it is going to evolve and change and I don't really have any control over the final product even though maybe I would like to think I do at certain points in the process. A couple of detail shots again just again uh, speaking to this idea of scale <coughs> zeroing right in and finding this this you know ever increasing complexity of of the materials doing this or behaving in this way that, that for me is very much um, on the same level as as natural processes of climate and geology, uh, tectonics, um, etc. Out of this last project, um, again with the circular format and how it was evoking for me a sort of uh, planetary scale, although it could be perhaps like satellite photo lens or something like that. I, I, I was really interested in, in thinking about the earth itself as a painting and the famous earth rise photograph that uh, Apollo 18 or whatever turned the capsule around and snapped of the earth and how I, but the only real piece of painting that I had around that I could cut out was, was quite small and those last paintings are, are quite large format and but this, this one piece I had that was going to allow me the ability to just play around with adding some cloud formation and stuff like this was the size of a dartboard, funnily enough. And out of that um, um, constraint of size uh, sort of brought about this idea of perpetrating this act of violence upon this representation of the earth 
at a small scale and through enacting that spoke to the I think the the dynamics that are very much going on um, as far as the human experience on this planet right now and and to to you know I hope it, if if this is exhibited in the gallery, which I'm sure it will be at some point, that people do go about that that um, exercise and feel that it's, although so simple and banal on one level, uh, it's I find it's also quite loaded too for me personally. Um, and now coming sort of out of this more literal stuff, I've been moving also into thinking about my studio as its own ecology, as its own ecology of ideas and of materials, recycled projects that don't work out, bits of canvas I've ripped off and don't really have an immediate use for on their own terms, but that hold within them um, still a lot of value and I can't bring myself to just toss them out. Uh, so this is an, another piece um, that's just been assembled from stuff that really resonates for me in my space and yeah not too too much really I have to say about that um, other than it is what it is sort of maybe related to the last piece and in, in terms of its idea of like an impact or or this kind of disintegration and the beauty that maybe is in that idea of, of disintegration and degradation. Detail shot. And so it that idea of working came about through my experience last year at the Hubei Institute and a body of work I produced there that came from uh, me observing this process of the university essentially clearing house because every five years the Communist Party does a major evaluation of of the school and this happens for every school in in China and so this happened to be going on right the same time we were visiting and so to the left here you see this big pile of refuse and just old projects and cast off stuff um, and for me just walking by it every day I was seeing stuff in there that was really activating me and I ended up just like every day I would find something in there and take it back to my own workspace and try and and work with it on a level and it was a way to like in an offhanded way, collaborate with the students. They just didn't really know that I was collaborating with them. <laughs> and um, so out of that, I brought a few of these works back, this being one of them, uh, that was just this sort of whitewash piece of panel, and then this rusty old piece of foam. And just by enacting a very simple series of gestures created, um, I don't know, this, this, this piece. And I mean, I could speak about this for like an hour if I wanted to or, or not, and I probably won't have to study speak for itself. Same with the next one, which is operating on a similar kind of level. It was this. I don't know. I'm calling it a butcher block, although that's not what it is. It's just a piece of wood um, that had a really interesting surface. And so the sandpaper was something I purchased myself. And then going through this process of sanding it down, cleaning it, um, speaks to this idea of cause and effect and how just on a, on a level of mark making and surface and pattern that can be produced through these sorts of actions, how 
whitewashing one, not whitewashing, but by smoothing one, you create this other more complex and uh, degraded set of patterns on the other. And funnily enough, this sort of thinking was what I leveraged into this proposal to go back, um, which I'm, I'm going to go in April, May, and June. And this is Zhang Guangwei. He's the Dean of Printmaking at Hubei. And um, we connected on a pretty deep level about this sort of way of working. And I, I don't know like how his re religious affiliation sits, if he's a Buddhist or a Taoist or Confucian. But going back, that's something that I'm really interested in researching, is how these Eastern ways of thinking become integrated into the art making process itself. Because, and he's a woodblock printmaker specifically. You can see some of his examples of work hanging there in, in process. Um, but how I pitched this research project was such that in Buddhism and in Taoism there are these deeply held tenets of ecology and, and balance. And I would like to know more about that. And I think that China at this moment in particular, huge, huge ecological stress going on in that geography, but also this ability as a population to, to mobilize, unlike anywhere else in the world, which, I mean, in the last 40 years to bring 90% of its population out of abject poverty is that's something noteworthy and I wonder moving forward into this century given the power and prominence of China how being that tradition plays so much a part of, of art making and daily life and having those ideas of ecology in there I wonder and that's what the research project is really going to center around and I'll report back mm -hmm. after. <laughs> um, so this here um, was is a very big reason of why I decided to come to Saskatchewan to to pursue my MFA was because of my ancestral roots here. Um, so this is near Imperial Saskatchewan and it's um, the farm where my grandmother was born and my grandmother moved back to Ontario when she was in her late teens and my branch of the family sort of lost connection with with um, with her her family that was still living here working this land so I wanted to do something to connect with that place and I didn't really know what to do so I used the land itself to, to make paint from and there's a bit of a circular uh, thing going on with this this work the, the making of the paint being the work I haven't used it to paint with although I've, I could and it uh, you know, it, it works as paint. Um, but it's when making oil paint, you have earth pigment on one hand, and you have the vehicle, which is linseed oil. So, linseed oil is really, it's just made from flax, which is one of the major crops produced of this land. So, by incorporating the earth pigment itself, going through the process of refining it in a really crude way. Um, just with a, a rock that I also picked up there too. Um, and then using linseed oil that, although I could bought it from Canadian Tire or whatever, very likely that that flax seed would have been produced in this neck of the woods. So, yeah. And 
this is a piece from this past summer um, that was produced where my fam a small piece of property my family has in Ontario um, that's leading to some some work I hope to do this summer uh, which I'll share after but it's a endeavor to to connect with geological mark making and and the idea of human experience in relation to geologic time and and investigating one piece of rock specifically which has just been scarred and mired by glacial and ice action over millennia and using the water in Georgian Bay um, that w is the remnants of that glaciation um, using it producing ice with it and then using the ice as a, as a mark making tool as a drawing tool to go over those marks uh, in this case on a very hot day where the, the contrast would would be quite stark when photographing it um, and just connecting with that that idea that these that the marks I'm interested in as an artist are really these marks that go beyond what what I can even do all I can do is maybe be a conduit through um, through my actions of emphasizing them perhaps um, and and by using the idea of mapping to mapping them out drawing the connection between how they f they form and how at the different scale the land forms in similar sorts of ways and dynamics like it, it's th it's this that really captivates me um, and the similarity that's that's there between them as you as you undertake this research you realize how connected things really are on the microcosmic scale and the macrocosmic scale so it's it's leading to this this idea I'd like to undertake when it warms up a little bit to to go back and investigate this sort of geology further maybe using a symbolic painterly material like a big strip of canvas is what I'm thinking or um, in China you can buy this really beautiful silk, silk printmaking paper and a scroll and I was thinking of using that in some way to to again emphasize this these glacial geologic marks and and perhaps even use it as a sort of material to be left there for a while so that it could bring together the idea of painting sculpture photo and interact with that microclimate that microecology and absorb its sort of energy and take on um, that that pattern that is in process there all the time ongoing and then maybe bring that back into the gallery as a as a material as a as a painting um, and yeah lots of ideas always on the go and I'd love to open it up to questions and that's kind of where that's been. thank you <laughs> That makes sense. Perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> Great to talk. Love your work. Um, I'm really interested in this last piece too. I mean, just from on so many levels, not just the environmental, ecological, but also from even a spiritual kind of um, perspective. Yeah. allowing that energy back and forth between the earth and the work and the, how are you securing how or how will you secure like how, how long will this stay on site have you and, and how would you Don't be know. still thinking about it yeah I kind of have to with an idea like this just based on how things have happened in the past it's the place itself is going to dictate those 
sorts of considerations. Um, you know, depending on how deep one of these mm -hmm. formations might be, you could tuck it in, and I'm sure that would secure itself for how long? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the, the wind. There's all those other ray. All those kinds. Yeah, of things, lots which could be of very things. interesting too. Totally interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think you just kind of got to go and assess assess the space specifically and see what kind of opportunities it's going to yield of itself or what sort of um, measures one would have to take to make sure that it didn't just blow away. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your first paint. Um, so the, the process, was, was the process the piece? Because the last time I missed the slide, you didn't really show what you did. So like with the stuff, so just making it was? Yeah. I didn't do anything with it, um, really. It's still sitting there in containers. And I don't know if I need to do anything with it beyond, like for, for me, the, the meaning of why that piece was meaningful for me was through that, that process of the making. And now that that has been done, you know, sure I could I could use it for something and maybe I will, but to me it was that, that way of connecting with that specific place. Did and you did you try it I'm just curious how did it react? Would it react to paper? Would it hang out just the same as any other paper? It, yeah, it, it, it behaves very much in the same way as as oil paint out of a tube does, although be, because I have you know, I was grinding it in at such a resolution, we'll say, that it's still pretty granular and you feel that on the brush. So it doesn't have the same sort of ability to move over distance that uh, conventional oil paint would, but, but uh, yeah, it still mixes with white and black and, you know, and do that sort of thing. Um, to that end, I did make a note about that. Yeah. Um, no, it's just the idea. Back to those, just super quick. The um, the mineral paintings um, and how they were like they're coming from refined earth pigment, right? Like they're coming all oil paint in some way. Is, is derived from, from stuff coming out of the ground and, and oftentimes how it's named will dictate where it came from. Like Siena is from Siena, Italy, originally. Umber is from Umbria and so on and so forth. And so in that way of, of undertaking the, the process of painting gold with um, earth pigments, like in a way they're distant cousins, right? And yeah, that was sort of part of that process too. So, so did you name your pigment? Yeah, I call it raw imperial. In imperial. <laughs> <laughs> and copyrighted. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I, I would like to say that I enjoy very much how you are addressing many different ways this friction that exists in, um, in the contact, basically, the, uh, geological contact or human and the world um, that you represented through your photographs, through your interventions in the rocks or through the sanding paper on this, this piece of that is now in, in, in eBay. Um, so, like, I, 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 I I find this very strong, you know, that uh, the connection that you're making in many different ways is so strong, you know, it's almost, I read almost like this, uh, there's almost a destructive aspect of it, but at the same time, a creative uh, uh, encounter, you know, mm -hmm. so I just want to mention that. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, everything is in a process of transformation 
change, entropy, you know, and I think I think that is in there on a, on a deep level between most of these words and trying to, I mean, for me personally, just seeing um, the beauty in that and the visual interest that invested, that, that holds for me. And to go back to that one, this one, you know, I think a lot about uh, when I see this, the relationship between like Earth and Mars, because Mars, they pretty well determined now at one point is covered in liquid water, and that's why it's the rust color that it is, right? All the water's gone, a little bit on the polar ice caps of it, but it's like, that's our future, that's this planet's future, like this is what that is going to look like long after we're gone, and I mean, it's when you start thinking in terms of geological time, it's a given. And through that embrace of that reality, uh, yeah, seeing, I see beauty in it. I don't know if others do, maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah. Yeah. Allie. Some of this work, um, addresses scale in a very interesting way. So I think I want you to talk a little bit about that. For example, this is looks a little bit like a country dish and, and yeah. some some of the work almost feels like you're looking at something in a very um, macro way. And so you haven't mentioned technology and I'm wondering if you want to just think about uh, um, responding to the idea of technology, the scale at which you work and also your way of looking from that kind of distance. Yeah, I can speak to it a little bit in terms of um, how technology maybe informs this way of looking, maybe. That, like, I was trained in my undergrad in geography, and so a lot of that sort of coursework you do there is through this program called GIS, which is sort of synthesizing remote sensing data from satellite imagery, from large-scale photographs, um, you know, that are tuned to different wavelengths so you can get different sorts of information through that. And I know that that informed on a level a lot of this in terms of the idea of looking at it from above, from some kind of remote place and um, but with a lot of that stuff if the scale is not indicated as such if you don't know that you're looking at um, a square photograph that's a mile by a mile if it was taken out of context and you know put in a gallery or just put on a table it, it could very well be some uh, blow up of a biological thing going on at the cellular level, you know, and it's in that ambiguity that I find huge points of interest and, and similarity. Um, so yeah, it could, I don't know if this is really asking your question regarding technology, but I suppose how we're accustomed to viewing um, all imagery scale becomes a very important metric to our understanding it or making sense of it. And when you strip that away, um, all we have is pattern and texture to make sense of. And it becomes increasingly harder to draw conclusions of a um, quantitative type when you don't have that. You know, to talk about this work in terms of scale, um, if we're actually referring to aerial perspective, or if we're actually talking about um, a perspective that comes with the 20th century, which is from outer space, yeah. then um, what we're talking about is a representation. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that your work is basically a process painting. So it's very much kind of grounded in this idea of the object painting. So there's actually another tension that's going on between uh, representation and abstraction in the work. 
Mm. I also would just like to point out that when you throw the darts into uh, the image that's already turned into a representation by making it circular and giving it this very overt planetary uh, representation, <coughs> the act of violence that you talk about there, um, I would just suggest that any kind of incursion onto a natural process that is like strict and geometrical, which maybe the darts even as objects are, mm -hmm. uh, but could be really anything, is a kind of um, uh, indication of you know like when you when you see uh, the way that uh, cut lines um, are uh, cut into the boreal forest in uh, in uh, the uh, Athabasca tar sands mm -hmm. is a kind of violence that is uh, very much of the Anthropocene uh, kind of stamping itself onto a geographic form. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't need to be as necessarily as overt, although I did find the darts kind of interesting, but it seemed like a bit of a one-off for you, but um, yeah. it, uh, it does, it does uh, seem like there's an interesting kind of maybe uh, potentiality there as well as another sort of manipulation. Well, there is this, just to speak to that too, to, and acknowledge that tension, there is a tension that's going on, you know, for me personally with regard to moving away from, or tr wanting to move away from this primacy of the art object and moving into a more process-based way of working and not getting hung up on making paintings as objects. Which well, is, the process you know, is the primacy, though. Yeah. But it's, I think it's the representation that's that we're bringing to it. Like, if we're talking about technology in regards to this, the real technology is that you're using a bucket and some brushes. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not about a lens looking at, a, at something right. from outer space. That only comes to us as a representation. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more. <laughs> <laughs> I just comment on something you just said because I was thinking from the beginning of your slides to the end, like you're you're kind of you know you're groping around abstraction initially and then sort of the process is really becoming strong. By the end, it feels like you're trying to convince yourself not to be a painter. Like you're putting these things out into the landscape and you're taking yourself out as an agent in a way, right? Of making. And I wondered about that, right? And you kind of just commented on that, like you're trying. You're questioning in a way the primacy of the painting or the object. Is yeah. It? So I kind of I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that because I could see that in the what you showed. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess the best way to maybe say it is I'm trying. I'm almost trying to develop my own sort of visual language where the vocabulary of painting is, in a big way, the content for that language and what that language is ultimately going to become. I don't have an answer yet. I'm still figuring that out. Um, but, uh, yeah, does that make You're any sense? You're still wanting it to be the vocabulary of painting, or could it even not be the vocabulary of painting? Because by the end, oh, I'm not doesn't. seeing that. Maybe mark making, you know, like by geology marking your... Yeah. Itself, right? That's not yeah. necessarily a painting frame. Thinking about it makes me think of Richard Vaughn or you know, artists who work in the landscape directly, right. document. Right. And you're kind of naming like photography, sculpture, and everyday three things that maybe paintings. Yeah, yeah, painting. Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer. As a person, you feel you have a strong political value. But that's not necessarily the heavy hand of the Maryland. It's pretty directly in the time. So we talk about materiality, process, how things resolve and operate. It's, uh, this reminds me of a school I was in where there was a stark division between the fine arts students and the graphic arts students. It was like, a big sponsor for advertising that kind of sponsored the graphic art section. Okay. It's a big division, quite a conflict between the two. Yeah. And they kind of avoided each other's territories. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, their student evaluation separately a few times, it was remarkable that the language 
Among the finance students doing their evaluations, they use words like how, uh, how a piece works, if it works, that was kind of the final statement there. And it stayed close to the material process, neutral kind of trend. My second on the evaluations of the advertising and graphic arts side of the school, when they were looking at their mock-ups of the ads and, and their very clear kind of narrative and graphics. They were telling a story. In their evaluations, the students commenting on other kids' projects, they were using words like, it's beautiful, it's stunning, it's fabulous. <laughs> it was like a total switch of the two mentalities, which you, would, you wouldn't have anticipated. The fine art students would be saying, oh, that piece works. And the advertising graphic art students were using that. You see a separation between you kind of feel strongly about ecology in the sense of the planets struggling with. Is that, is that I mean, don't we all? You started out with a, a parallel of economy and ecology. Yeah. Was ecology just the geographic, physical planet, or was it any kind of political? I don't I yeah, I don't really try and wade into the, the poli politics of it. Really that's not the word ecology. ecology. Ecologists kind of suggest a social justice warrior kind of mentality. Well yeah, I think you can certainly you could read you it's a loaded word. That's and not something you want to bring into your heart. Yeah. <coughs> I don't, not necessarily. I, it might, it might not. I admire the confidence that you seem to have in, like, it's, in positioning yourself so openly and in such a permeable way. And I see all kinds of really interesting kinds of contradictions. And, and I saw that from you like as, as soon as you got here. I mean, you came here as like this painter, but everything you seem to do seems to be resisting uh, painting, right? And, uh, and, and on the one hand, you talk about you know, your, uh, yourself as an artist as being a conduit. Well, that's a, a kind of language that an abstract expressionist might use. But on the other hand, you seem to be very interested in, in systems that are uh, out, out there, uh, ecological, economic systems. I know that you had a, a project that you told me a little bit about that you didn't mention here tonight, about, yeah, I know you're, you're a musician, right? And so I know that you were sort of uh, taking samples of, of sounds, audio samples, and, and, and coming up with, and I, I, I'm only bringing this up because I, know that you are interested in these things. So on yeah. the one hand, you're sort of this kind of abstract expressionist guy, and on the other hand, you've got these kinds of a conceptualist approach to art making, and, and, and they're not, it, it's never one way or another. You're happy, it seems, with when you showed the, uh, the, 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 the paintings that you displayed on the floor of the various elements, gold and copper, et cetera, et cetera. But those were not the materials themselves. They were facsimiles. They were yeah. they were painted representations of those materials. So um, with that piece, you're on the side of being a painter. But with so many others, you're on, this, uh, on a different side. Anyway, it's, it's not really a comment, but, but I just see all these different things happening with you. And I appreciate that you seem to be OK with juggling all of these things in such a state of irresolution at this point. Yeah, and you know, I don't know. Will they ever become all resolved neatly? I don't know, they might not. A lot of my sound work right now, I hate, I don't, it's all still very chromatic, the way it ends up, which is, it's like it's still very much in the, the music side of things, although it's informed by certain um, sources out out in the, on the land and, and stuff like that. I haven't found a way to bring it into a context that's more 
art, and maybe that's a, there's an obviously a tension there. Does it need to? Does it not? I I don't know. That's still something I'm working out. But but yeah, very much in line with what you're saying. Would you be comfortable with sort of kind of landscape painting? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Maybe. <laughs> you only um, showed one image that you started with at the very beginning. Maybe it's not so representative because um, I'm only seeing one. Yeah. But yeah. there you definitely had different terms like with the wood pieces or yeah. whatever that material was that was stuck on top, it seemed like an intervention, like a human intervention yeah. onto a landscape. But in um, the work that you've been developing since then, I almost feel um, that you're um, getting, trying to get rid of any kind of boundary between um, humankind and the world. Like everything's kind of melding in together. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like in your process, you're experiencing or trying to experience a geological time through, you know, through our short lifespans mm -hmm. in relation to the rock, etc. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a totally accurate <coughs> reading. I am like that's where my interest is does seem to be to be leading me is in that sort of a place. That or the delineation is yeah. ceases to exist. Or, but, but in the project you talk about that you're going to embark on in, in, um, when you go to China, that does seem more political and because it seems to be, from my understanding, it's like, oh, what's going to happen to this kind of traditional cultural sense of landscape when now there's all this industry and its impact? Yeah. So that seems... I I don't imagine you'll actually deal with that once you're there, but yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. There. Just hopefully not get thrown in jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather curious too. Again, with that final, I'm I'm intrigued by the silk, you know, over okay. the rocks and nature, and then and Marcus brought it, and, and you mentioned earlier to me as well about your interest in sound and music, and it all of a sudden would it interest you to find a way to maybe record sounds that are occurring in conjunction with this work or how this work might affect sound. I'm just throwing it out there as a curious... Potentially, thing. yes. Yeah, these are all rich territories that I'm interested in exploring, for sure. Whether or not it happens here or after this program, I don't know. Okay. Ali, I, I, you know what, I'd, I'd love to just have you try to the question about the landscape. Yeah, I think that was me a very too. interesting question. <laughs> me too. And you know, if somebody was to come into the gallery and see these works, for example, I think they work really well as in their round form, incidentally, to have never talked about that. But I mean, the, the impetus for the work might be very complex and loaded. The result could still be landscape painting. So yeah, okay. what's your big concern there? No, it's not it's not a big concern. I guess the my, when we say landscape art, it takes us to a very specific place, specific associations, be it the group of seven or uh, whatever. Um, and I, I just, my, and it's like I just don't want to be looped in with a certain way of working or school and the definition, I suppose, of what landscape art is, is ever changing and what that definition now is versus what it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago has to be acknowledged and sort of held um, as, as uh, a given. Is, is somebody like Anselm Kiefer not a landscape painter? I, it's just kind of interesting, right? Because I think yeah, we could debate. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but could landscape be more surface? And I don't think you're dealing with the surface. Isn't it more like kind of Mother Earth or Gaia? I, or? 
Sometimes a landscape is just a landscape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a, I, we got a round probably. <laughs> 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 Only because I have a new one. To, but no, but Gabrielle, you, you want to say well, I just want to say that uh, uh, about, I don't know, landscape here, but about a painter, you know, about, uh, about you as a painter, as, uh, as somebody who uses the medium of painting uh, almost as, not as, as a material, but as a vehicle of, of research. I think it's very important your knowledge about the nature of the pigments or the nature of the composition of paint, etc., comes a lot into an introspection that is, can be seen in your in your uh, studio as a laboratory of of, of a very deep uh, inner research, and I, I can see that, and I, I, I think it's that's pretty well. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.